Fantasy Star was released on the Sega Master System in Japan in December of 1987, and then in November of 1988 in the US and Europe. This was developed and published by Sega in an attempt to get a foothold in the emerging RPG market, which at the time was dominated by Enix's Dragon Quest. Fantasy Star was released only two days after Squaresoft released the original Final Fantasy. I never played Fantasy Star growing up because I didn't have a Master System. And at the time, not that many kids in my neighborhood did. To capture this footage, I'm using the SMS Power Retranslation Patch. This is a translation more faithful to the original Japanese script, and it allows for the use of the Japan-exclusive FM Synthesis Audio. Directed by Kotaro Hayashida and programmed by Yuji Naka, who now works for Square Enix, Fantasy Star has a hybrid of fantasy and sci-fi elements. It was inspired by Star Wars, so you'll be riding on spaceships and fighting dragons, casting magic spells and exploring dungeons in your quest to avenge Alice's brother and defeat the evil Emperor Lashik. Like your typical JRPG of the era, Fantasy Star consists of towns, dungeons, and fields. You'll travel from area to area either on foot or using one of several vehicles. Encounters are random and the encounter rate becomes really high later in the game. It can get pretty exhausting. A unique element of Fantasy Star is the addition of space travel. While it is very limited, you can travel to three different planets. The main planet, Palma, is the largest, with the other two being much, much smaller. Once you make it into the late game, you can use your own spaceship to travel to a specific spaceport town on each planet. Fast travel exists, but it's very hamstrung. You can use an item or spell to exit a dungeon or return to the last church you visited. Sometimes this can be really inconvenient, especially if you don't remember when you last stopped at a church. This can result in a long walk back to where you need to go. Towns are populated by stationary NPCs and houses or shops you can visit. Engaging with an NPC cuts to a first-person view instead of a traditional dialogue box which really adds to the visual experience of the game. Unlike many other games, the NPCs actually give useful information and it's totally possible to figure out where to go and what to do next simply by talking to NPCs. Unfortunately, shops aren't labeled and you have to go into each shop to discover what is being sold there. Moreover, there are no item descriptions or tooltips of any kind, so you'll need the instruction manual or a guide to help you figure out which items and equipment you can use or what you should be using. While the original localization calls healing items Burger and Cola respectively, the original names are Roganin and Pelorimate, so I get why they were changed, but it's still an odd choice, especially given that you get them at a pharmacy. Another unique feature of Fantasy Star is the dungeon design. When you enter a dungeon, the game shifts to a first-person perspective, more like a western dungeon crawler RPG. It's easy to get lost in these, especially some of the larger ones. You can find maps online, but if you want to do this without help, I recommend a pencil and graph paper so you can map your progress as you play. I like how you actually have to take a few steps back if you run from an encounter. The general flow of gameplay consists of going to a town, being told you need some kind of item that can be found in a dungeon or another town, and then going to get said item and move on to the appropriate area to use that item. Sometimes you'll have to use the search command in very specific spots in order to find important items, just like in Dragon Quest. There are four playable characters in Fantasy Star. You start out with just Alice, who can wield a sword and shield and use some magic. She can even interpret foreign languages and talk to some enemies instead of fighting. This will give you information, and you get to avoid the fight. Soon you'll meet Meow, a cat-like creature who is weak at first but becomes very strong later on. Tyrion, also known as Odin, a warrior who can use guns and attack all enemies on screen. And Lutz, also known as Noah, a powerful wizard who can speak to enemies that Alice cannot by using telepathy. This is one of the first JRPGs to use predetermined characters instead of having the player create a party. You'll notice throughout this video that some of the names of characters and items will be different from what is in the US version. Battles are first person with the player characters invisible. Only one enemy model appears on the screen at any time, regardless of how many enemies are in the party. All enemies will be of the same type. The combat is turn based with no fancy ATV gauges or anything like that. It's about as old school as it could possibly be. You can save anywhere, which is a great feature. One of the hardest things about classic RPGs is that you had limited save points, and dying would often mean losing two hours of progress. In Fantasy Star, you can even save in the middle of a dungeon. Unfortunately, there is no way to recover magic points except for resting or visiting a hospital, so it's possible to run out of magic points before finishing a dungeon, forcing you to return to a town. Churches can bring a dead party member back to life, and also let you know how many experience points you need to get to the next level. Fantasy Star is relatively short and can be completed within about 10 hours if you use maps and guides, but can take significantly longer if you decide to play organically. 
You have to do some grinding here and there, especially early in the game when Alice is weak and can easily be killed by common enemies. While watching this footage, I'm sure you've noticed how colorful and detailed the graphics are. The Master System had excellent graphics light years ahead of Famicom due to a 16-bit graphics chip. It also has a much better color palette as you can see. It's nice to see all four playable characters appear on screen while traveling, even if they don't have much animation. Enemy sprites even have a little bit of animation, which is really something for 1988. Spell and weapon effects look pretty nice too, even though there's not much of them. There are some short but beautiful cutscenes with anime-inspired close-ups of the character models. There's not a lot of animation, but there's quite a lot more detail than anything else that was available on a home console at the time. The dungeon walls are really simple, but they also look really nice. There's something very pleasant and satisfying about them. Designer Rieko Kodama had worked on many games for Sega, including Shadow Dancer and Sonic the Hedgehog, and most recently worked as a producer on the 7th Dragon series for the Nintendo DS. I touched before on how the Japanese version has FM synthesis audio. This is because there was an updated Master System released only in Japan that had this feature. This was never released in the West, so if you've played the US or Europe version of the game, you've only been able to hear the PSG sound. The FM synthesis makes a huge difference. Take a listen, we'll listen to the FM synthesis after we first hear the PSG sound. While the music is good, there are only 5 songs in the whole game and it does get a little grating after a while. It would be nice if there were a few more. While Fantasy Star was a lot of fun to discover, I found myself getting bored around halfway through the main story. There's just a lot of palette swapped enemies, there's not that much change throughout the game, you have the same party for basically the entire length of the campaign, there's only a handful of magic spells and weapons, you don't get to upgrade your equipment often, you visit the same towns again and again, there's a lot of backtracking, so yeah, it did get kind of tedious after a while, and the high encounter rate just started getting exhausting. Although, Fantasy Star was definitely way ahead back in 1988, and I would say it's absolutely worth a playthrough. Even today, it's still held in very high regard among retro gamers, and was a critical success after its launch. It's still held as being a revolutionary game, being the first to do a lot of things like have party members that were predetermined before it began, uh, the ability to travel between space uh, planets, the dungeons being first person, it had a lot of innovative qualities that are still praised to this day. It is absolutely and for sure worth a playthrough. There is a remake on PS2 that I'm going to cover in the future, and the original game was also released on the Saturn and on the Nintendo Switch, so definitely get, give it a chance. You might love it. You might get a little bored of it, but either way, it's worth experience just to live that piece of history. Thank you for watching Risky Bitness, and until next time, game over.